start off with a question. Um, how many of us want to get to the end of our lives and have people, you know, gather around at our funeral and have them talk about things that we have accumulated throughout our lives? How many of us would like that, right? How many of us want people to stand around talking at our funeral, talking about the cars we collected, the houses we collected, the collections we collected, right? Whether it's your stamp collection, your rock collection, your, my, my one grandma collects decorative teacups. And I didn't know that was a thing. Anybody else know that was a thing? I had no idea. My, my grandmother was an Avon lady for 45 years, and she was a tremendous Avon lady, very successful. Well, when she retired, she liquidated everything she owned that was Avon and started replacing all that space in her house with decorative teacups. And I didn't know this, um, and so I showed up at their house for Christmas, this is a number of years ago now, and went into their basement, and there's an entire basement wall of teacups, right? Now, we might laugh and joke a little bit at her funeral. She's, praise the Lord, still ticking and doing well. We might laugh and joke a little bit about it, but we're not going to be talking about that. And my guess is most of us don't really want that sort of talk at our funeral, right? Most of us, what we want is we want people to be sharing stories about how we had given of our, of our time, uh, given our energy, given our passion, given our talents, given our, our money in ways that significantly changed people's lives. And if you have children or if you have grandchildren, how many of you would love to see them become more generous people? How many of you want to see and, and want to see them grow and be more willing to give and more excited to give and more passionate and more generous in their giving? And how many of us feel excited and passionate about our own giving, right? How many of us want to be more generous? Does anybody else want to be more generous? I do. I want to be more generous, right? And so for the next four weeks, we're going to address some issues as we learn some lessons about what it means to give. And I'm not talking about just giving money here. We already collected, so don't worry about it. I'm not going to ask for a second collection, and I don't get more money even if you give more money. So that's not what this is about. This is about generosity, right? And my hope is in the next four weeks, including today, that we will all be challenged to live life differently. And that through that we can find ways to give more. Give more of ourselves to God as well as to our families, to our friends, to our community, to the church, and the world beyond as well. To learn about giving, I got this acronym GIVE, which makes sense, I think. And each one of those stands for one thing we'll look at each week. And this week it's going to be generosity. That's the G. The I is inspiration. We'll look at that next week. Uh, the week following, we're going to look at vision. And then finally, we'll close it with effectiveness. And each one of these words will teach us something different about giving. And so, as I said, today we start with generosity. Now, if you haven't done any studies on the word generosity, generosity is inter an interesting word. I, I dug into it. I didn't know its background, didn't know its history. And up until the 17th century, so the 1600s, right? Up until the 17th century, the word generosity had a little bit different meaning than it does today. It meant simply that you had been born of noble birth. Okay? You were somebody special, right? Royalty almost. You're nobility. And it was that way up until the 17th century. And that word was exclusively used to talk about these noble people, the nobility, the people with the right blood, coming from the right bloodlines, right? But then somewhere in the 17th century, the definition, as words often do, began to change and shift a little bit. And it changed and became more about generosity. And it came to talk about having a noble spirit and character rather than just actually being nobility. And a generous person wasn't just somebody then that was born into the right family, but a person whose life was characterized by noble virtues like courage and strength and kindness. And then by the 18th century, the word changed again and its focus uh, became a little more narrow again. And it began to focus on just one of those virtues and it was the focus on the virtue of giving of money and possessions to others. Now what's important about all of this is that being generous isn't something that we just do. It should be a reflection of who we are, 
Okay? There's a difference in an individual act of generosity and it being part of the fabric of who we are. And today we are going to define generosity simply as this. Generosity is giving good things to others freely and abundantly. So giving good things to others freely and abundantly. So there's an attitude within that, an attitude within generosity. We give freely. We give without the thought of return. It's not, I'll scratch your back if you'll scratch mine. Although if you scratch my back, I will probably scratch your back because I like having my back scratched, but that's neither here nor there, right? But it's not, what will I get from you? We give freely. We don't give because we're forced to give. We're not compelled to give. We give because we choose to. So there's an attitude involved with generosity. But there's that second part. There's the action part, right? We, we have to do something to be generous. We have to give something. Whatever it is, give it joyously. Give it generously. Give a lot of it. Give it in abundance. That is generosity. And, and we can and need to do that with our money. Because that, of course, is a valuable resource. The Bible talks a lot about money. I've talked about money before. Money is not evil. Money is neutral. But money can cause problems. It's the roots of all kinds of evils, right? But it's more than just money. So as we think of generosity, I want to kind of broaden that category out of just what you keep in your wallet and your checkbook and your purse. Right? It's more than that. We can and need to give money because it is a valuable resource. It's a part of all of our lives. And unfortunately, money has the power to take hold of our lives. But we can also give of our, of our possessions, right? We can give of our time. Many of you have been incredibly generous to me and my family, helping me unload trailers and trucks. And a couple of you drove all the way down to Waseca, Minnesota and drove a car back up here for me. And, you know, I mean, just tremendously generous in time. So we can give of our time. Uh, we can give help. We can give support emotionally, right? We can be there emotionally available for other people. We can give forgiveness. We don't think of forgiveness, do we, when we think of generosity. But how much would you like to be known as a person who is generous in forgiveness? Wow. If somebody came to my funeral, said, that man was generously forgiving. Wow. I would know I made a difference. How about being generous in encouragement? Is anybody here over-encouraged in their lives? Yeah. The world is negative. We, we go out those doors and the world is waiting. And it wants to beat us up. It wants to wear us down. And if you've ever spent time, and you know you have, if you've been there, if you've ever spent time with somebody who was generously, generously giving of encouragement, they're like a, a magnet. They're like a tractor beam. People just draw near, right? You ever had a coach who was an encourager? Everybody wants to play for that coach. Guys will break bones to play for that coach to make a play because he was an encourager. So generosity is more than simply just giving of money. It's that, but it's a whole lot more. And many other things than even what I've listed. So we can give many different things, but how often we give is it's important because generosity isn't simply a one-time gift as much as it is a lifestyle. Okay? Remember the word generous. It talked about the entire life. The entire life of the person. Not just a singular action. What makes this really incredibly important is for us to understand that when we give freely, when we give abundantly, when we give day in and day out, every day, week after week, year after year, that giving has the capacity to change and shape our hearts to help us live in ways that just giving one time cannot do. It feels nice to write a check, right? And give it away. One time. 
But you make the difference by showing up every day and coaching that team. You make the difference by being an encourager to that coworker who's just had a really rough year. We make a difference by showing up each and every day being generous. One act is nice, but generosity is more than just one time. So generosity is a way of living that leads to a lifetime of giving. And a lot of what I want to share on generosity comes from a book. It's called The Paradox of Generosity, a book by Christian Smith and Hilary Davidson. And back in 2010, they did an extensive study of of people from here in America, and, and this is what they found out. Those who give receive back in turn. Okay? By spending a little bit of ourselves, of whatever it is we're going to give, and giving that away, by spending it and giving it away, they found in return we end up enhancing our own standing and well-being. In letting go of a little bit of what we own, we better secure our own lives. By giving ourselves away, we ourselves end up flourishing. I love that word, flourish. I want to flourish. You ever grown flowers? Maybe plants, corn, wheat? And you've seen it flourish? That bumper crop? That rose bush that just puts out roses like crazy? That, that tree that produces apples like crazy? I want to thrive. I want to flourish. And what they found is, by giving ourselves away, in turn, we flourish. And this isn't just a philosophical or religious teaching. It's a sociological fact. They've got the data that backs it up. Now, of course, as Christians, as people of the Word of God, none of this should come as a surprise to any one of us, right? Because if you've read your Bible, this is in there, isn't it? Right? Let's look at a couple of passages. We'll look at Proverbs 11, 24 through 25 first. That says, One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what they should give and ends up only suffering want. Wow, did you know that was in there? That's pretty good case from the Word of God. Now, if we just had one passage, we might be able to make some arguments. But hear these words. This is Malachi 3. You've heard these before. Malachi 3, 10 through 12. The Word of God says, Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you, so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil, and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. Huh. Maybe the Bible says something in the New Testament about that too. What do you think? I bet it does. Luke 17, 33. The words of Jesus. I read in my Bible at least. Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it. Trying to keep it for themselves, right? But whoever loses his life shall keep it, says Jesus. So the scriptures echo this very idea that giving in some way improves our lives. And this is the very thing that Smith and Davidson found. And when they looked at the data and the statistics, they found that there are five concrete areas that giving of all these things, there's five specific places in life that improve when we give. Those areas are happiness, So when we give, our happiness improves. I know that's true for me. Our physical health improves when we give. Our purpose for living increases. We have less depression when we're generous people. 
And we take up interest in the subject. We have personal growth and interest on the thing that we're giving to. And so our passions are inflamed in that area. And what they discovered is that the more people gave of their time and of their money and of all the things that they have, the more positive they experienced in return. The people who gave more were happier, they were healthier, had a greater sense of purpose in life, they experienced less depression, and had a greater desire to learn and to grow. I want that, right? So let me ask you, do you want any of those things today? Happier, healthier, less depression, more excited about life, all those things? No depression or less depression, doesn't say no depression, less depression. Do we want that? I think we do. I think all of us want that. I think the world wants that. And if we want that, I just read you the scripture. I just read you the word of God. The answer is simple, right? If we want those things, we need to give generously. We need to give joyously. That's the way we're taught in scripture. Now studies have shown it's not just giving that makes people happier and healthier, but it's giving generously, right? Remember the story of the widow's mite in the Bible? It's an interesting story. I'm not preaching that today, but it's interesting how this little old lady has a mite. This, not, not a little bug, but the, the smallest unit of currency. So she's got a penny which they're saying they're going to get, a, get rid of here pretty soon, I think. But she's still got a penny, one copper penny to her name, right? She goes to worship, puts that penny in the offering, and worships. Along comes rich, fancy religious guy. I got all this money, dragging bags of money behind him. Handful of gold coins and throws it in there, Right? But his pockets are so heavy, he doesn't even notice those coins are gone. And Jesus says, that wasn't worship. That wasn't glorifying a God. And so we have to give generously. That, that's the Bible says. It's not what pastor says. Although I would encourage you in it. And what they found as they studied this, something very interesting happens as you give more. They found that people who would volunteer three hours a week, they were happy. But the people who volunteered six hours a week, they were happier. Huh. Interesting. Right? The people who gave a little bit of money to whatever the group was, they liked the group and they had some involvement. But the people who gave a lot of money, I'm not just talking to church. This is all sorts of things. The people who gave a lot of money, they were invested. They were involved. They wanted to see the thing thrive, right? And you know this. If you've gotten behind something in your life, the more you give, the more you want to see that positive return. You're invested. And there's a very real correlation between giving generously and being happy and being healthy. So if you're wondering why this might be, let me give you two answers. One is physical and one is emotional. And studies have shown that when people give generously, whether it's of your time, your treasures, your talents, whatever it is, it releases a chemical inside of our brains, actually a group of chemicals. And those chemicals are the chemicals that in us inspire pleasure. They reduce our stress and they suppress pain. That sounds pretty nice, right? They take away our anxiety. Things like oxytocin and dopamine and serotonin and endorphins are the things that are released when we have that joy of giving generously. So giving literally makes us healthier and happier. And there's the data and statistics to prove that. Now that doesn't mean we're not going to get sick. I wish it did. I'd just give it all away then, right? Well, generous people still get cancer. Generous people still have diabetes. Generous people still have problems. That is true. This isn't a magic panacea, fix it all kind of thing. But it will make us happier and healthier than we otherwise would be. 
And the other thing that generosity fosters, the other thing that it does for us, is it reinforces positive emotions, which leads us to greater happiness, to a greater sense of personal well-being. We simply feel better about ourselves when we give generously. I mean, think about how good it feels to serve somebody else. How good does it feel to make a difference in someone else's lives? Many of you in the room are grandparents. You know this intimately, right? Now, it might feel like a, a tornado went through your home after your grandchildren came and visited. I know it's that way with my son when he visits my parents or my wife's parents, right? After three or four days, my in-laws have the look of war vets. They're shell-shocked <laughs> from having my son there. But I know without a doubt that they feel really good after he leaves. Partially because he left. <laughs> but mostly because they made a difference in his life. My son adores both sets of his grandparents. He loves them. He prays for them every day. Loves them. Because they're generous in their love to him. It's not because they've given him fancy gifts. They've given him, given him some cool stuff, but... It's because they give him of his time, of their time. They invest in that little guy so he can grow and flourish. Right? It's like pouring fertilizer on the kid. And if he grows like me and my wife, he's got plenty of fertilizer already in store. But uh, we thrive in this setting, right? And we all can do that. We all can choose to do that. And we know that. Like I said, if you're a grandparent, after your kids leave, it's kind of like, we made it. But I feel really good about that. I made a difference. I did something good. I invested. And while you might not see a return this week, right? 10 years, 20 years, 30 years down the road, those tiny little investments you've made all along the way into your kids, into your grandkids, can bear fruit. So it's about doing it every day. And as we do it, it brings us a sense of well-being personally. And so I hope you can see the evidence of how powerful and life-changing generosity can be. When we give freely, when we give abundantly, we get so much in return. Better mental health, physical health, and all of those things. So the question is, if this is true, and it is, why then don't we live that out more faithfully and more consistently? Why aren't we more generous regularly? Well, in their study, Smith and Davidson found out that only 4 or 5% of Americans, 4 or 5% of Americans, give 10% or more of their income away. We know that's true. There's a lot of data on this. You realize in America there's people who don't have food to eat? You realize in America there's more money in food than people could ever eat? Somehow that math doesn't work for me. There's problems, right? We can choose to make a difference. And that's just one area of many areas. So as Americans, only 4 or 5%. That's a tiny amount give more than 10% of their overall income. Church is a little bit higher, but sadly, the church isn't a whole lot better either. The Barna Group has studied this, and we like to go, yeah, we, we, we like to tithe, right? But, uh, well, frankly, lots of churches don't. Hmm. So we're missing out on opportunities that God has given us. We're missing out on the abundance of God, the grace of God. He's provided. One of the things you'll hear me pray when I pray out loud frequently in a corporate setting, and I have no idea where this came from. I don't know if somebody said it and I picked it up or I came up with it so you can steal it if you want. But one of the things I say when I pray frequently is, God, let me not be the stopping point of your grace. God's grace manifests itself in many, many ways, folks. 
God, let me not be the stopping point to the money, of the time, of the treasure, of the talents, of the influence, of the love, of the forgiveness, of all those things that you, God, have so graciously, gracious, graciously bestowed upon me. Let, me. let me not be the stopping point of that. I want to be a funnel. I want to be a collector of that, and I want to shoot it out into places useful. Right? That's what generosity does. Generosity is a funnel that takes in all the things God is pouring into us that we can redirect into specific places to make a difference in our lives and in the world. And when we don't, we're cutting ourselves off from happiness. We're cutting ourselves off from purpose. We're cutting ourselves off from better health. Now one of the reasons we don't do this, because I asked the question why, is frankly, being generous is hard work. Right? Being generous doesn't come easy. It doesn't come naturally to us. It requires us to learn something different than what the whole rest of the world is constantly trying to teach us. Generosity doesn't come easy. We live in a world where more is better, bigger is better. Right? We used to call it keeping up with the Smiths or the Johnsons if you're up north. Right? Swedish Baptists. Or Swansons. Whatever. But we used to call it keeping up. We don't hear that phrase so much anymore. And I think the reason we don't hear it so much anymore is it's Satan's lies and tricks. He's quit talking about keeping up with our neighbors. So we don't focus on the fact that we shouldn't be trying to keep up with our neighbors. If we're going to try to keep up with our neighbors... Let us try to keep up with them by out generousing them. How about that for a while? Instead of trying to get the bigger boat, instead of trying to get the nicer car, the bigger house, instead of trying to have the grandkids who have whatever it is, more A's, let us be known as the ones who are generous. Let us be known as the guy in the cabin down there who will do anything for anyone. Be that shirt off the back kind of person. Let us be the lady who will go out of her way to serve somebody else. Let us be those people. If we are generous as a people of glory, people will see God through it. I guarantee it. Pastors don't make a lot of guarantees. And I guarantee that. If you are generous, day in and day out, people will begin to wonder why. Because you look a little bit different, don't you? Why do you keep doing this? Why do you keep giving this? Why do you keep forgiving me? Why do you... Why? It confuses people. It makes them uncomfortable, in fact. But it opens up gospel opportunities for us to say, I give because I love. And I love because I was first loved. And you know who first loved me? Jesus. And when people are there, their hearts are open. When people are in that place where they're asking those questions, they're ready to hear the gospel. Now, they may not receive it, but they're kicking the tires. So we have to ask ourselves, how does God want us to live? And I think very clearly, God wants us to live generously. So think about this for just one moment. We're going to do communion in a little minute, but think about one place in your life this week where you could be more generous. Not a one-time gift kind of place, but somewhere you could be more generous. Maybe it's just sitting down and having lunch with somebody at the nursing home who doesn't always have somebody to sit with. Right? Right? You do that in your high school, although they're out of school. But I remember sitting down with some kids when I was in high school who weren't the popular kids. This is before I'm a Christian, so don't give me any credit for being Christian about it. But just sitting with some kids to be nice. Right? And sitting with them every day, not just once. If I go sit with that kid one day, and I'll sit with him the next, it did nothing. Right? If you know cafeteria politics... 
It didn't change their life. But if I go sit with that kid every day, it changes how they feel about themselves and how other people feel about them. Same way at nursing homes. We can be generous in many ways. How can you be generous this week in a repeatable way to make a difference in Aiken and Aiken County that can change the world, that can change people's eternities? Generosity calls for some tough decision making on our parts. We, we will have to make sacrifices and make choices about where we can and cannot always be generous. But if we learn this new way of life, if we integrate it into the fabric of our being, God will use us to do amazing things for His glory. Back to God for a moment. Jesus did some soul searching, right? He was very intentional in his decision making about being generous. Jesus spent time in prayer where he asked God how God wanted him to live his life and how much he should give where and when. Jesus had to make some difficult decisions. He couldn't heal everybody. He couldn't go to every town. He couldn't do everything. He was God, but he was a man. And he was in one place at one time. So he had to make decisions about where and when to be generous. But wherever Jesus went, his generosity changed people's lives and changed our world. Changed it forever. Jesus didn't have a whole bunch of money, right? We know that. But he gave everything of himself. He invested in others. He taught others. He encouraged others. He healed others. And eventually he gave of himself for others in the ultimate act of generosity. And the communion meal that we are going to celebrate today is the place where we are reminded of that incredible generosity that we first received. So today, as we come in just a minute and we take the bread and we take the cup, let us remind ourselves that it is God calling us to give of what we have as we were first given. When we share in communion, we are saying that we want to follow in the footsteps of Jesus and be more like Him. So as we come to the table today. Let us come as a people who will intentionally pursue after God to be more generous as he was generous to us. Amen. Let's pray.